Well, the alarm clock went off this morning. I was in the midst of a dream, and there was a, a sort of large guy that I was being reading. Are you dumb or are you lazy? It was the last thing I remember saying when the... Uh, there was nothing personal. There was nobody there. There was nobody there. And then, then the clock went up at 6.30. Conversation with my dogs, they're about the same size. Well, this is another, another cultural historical perspective of nature, on nature, that again is another dimension on the development of my hypothesis that I've been developing and will continue to develop through the court. And this one was raised, not just obliquely, it mentioned a couple of times in the response. I'm trying to respond to the response so they keep it flowing. And this one is social dominance. It came up last time, hierarchical social structures and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the goals, if it hasn't been made clear already, one of the goals in all of my work really is to try to uh, try to better understand and evaluate the role of contemporary science, especially biology and ecology, in environmental affairs. Obviously, that's not even the hidden agenda I've mentioned enough times, so that I can better understand the environmental movement itself and its cultural and historical roots. All right. And in the course of these um, presentations that I give on, the, on these Thursdays, I, I'm using a few of the more widely given, I guess, widely accepted principles of ecology and biology and ethology in order to just make some points of penetration into the uh, into this bigger cultural problem of perspectives of nature. You've probably heard me say before that every problem is spherical, so the original point of penetration doesn't matter who, they're all the same. Join up the dots later. And the particular examples that I've used so far and will continue to use are fairly arbitrary, I guess, but not, not entirely. There are others, but I've tried to, to seize on or fasten on uh, things that nowadays seem to have moved outside the exclusive uh, domain of science or purview of science into the wider social cultural community if you like things that have become kind of buzzwords part of the conventional wisdom beyond science next time a week from now I'm going to talk about territoriality territory a little bit about aggression and things like that but today social dominance uh, now these are ecology in the strictest and narrow sense, but because they're matters of behavior, but the behavior of all of us, all of us creatures, 
is an essential part of our ecology, after all. The way in which they, all of us conduct our affairs, the way in which we make a living, we and other beings. So in that sense, I'm seeing ethology, the study of behavior, as a branch of the wider enterprise of ecology, which is itself a branch of the wider enterprise of biology. Of course, since there's risen such a general stink in the last few years, a general fuss about the, uh, about the uh, genetic, but possibly or evolutionary underpinnings of social behavior in animals, I mean, we're all aware of that fuss and feathers over the last decade or so including ourselves. Studies of social organizations seem to have moved right up to the front and center in the, both in science and even more important for our work here, not only in science but in the public diet of popular science, which is much more important in my view. The, what the public is choosing to take as conventional wisdom in the popular press and in the not so popular press is much more important in many, many ways than what science is actually saying. One of the phenomena that I think all of us only realizes gradually or over time, you don't realize it, it can take a lot of time, and it did in my case, is the extraordinary, the literally indescribable power and weight of the belief system that supports any culture. It, it, it is absolutely beyond your, I guarantee you, your imagination is still beyond mine. The immense power and weight of the belief system sustains any culture. Now this power and weight of cemented beliefs, it, 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 it becomes especially interesting when you begin to recognize the relative arbitrariness of the perceptions that underlie them and support them. The relative arbitrariness, all of them. This is what I'll be trying to illustrate today and next week in particular. I'll, I'll try to show that the idea of competition, for example, in communities may well be arbitrary. There may be other ways to interpret that. I'm going to try to show that notions of territory and aggression may be entirely arbitrary projections upon nature, gratuitous, if you like, projections upon nature. And there may be other ways of interpreting exactly the same body of evidence, on the same evidence, different conclusions. Now, that, that all of us have difficulty in perceiving options or alternatives to these gratuitous perceptions is evidence, I think. Yeah, I can see it in your eyes. It's evidence of the power and weight of the cultural belief system. It simply is. I often think that an unrevealed perceptual option is even harder to identify than a so-called unoccupied niche, which is, of course, as you know, a loop and a contradiction in terms. But an unrevealed perceptual option is something like that. It's black box. We have another, but very similar, uh, but obviously related in a derivative sense. We have another set of unquestioned assumptions in the matter of social organization, which is usually expressed in terms of social dominance in all of literature, often in entirely respectable literature, is social despotism. You will find that, talk about anthropomorphism, you will find that in the most serious of literature, especially in primatology. What we're actually talking about, though, when we drop the pejoratives, is simply social organization, is it not? And I believe, as a lot of others do too now, the deeper understanding of the nature of social organizations in non-human beings may allow us to retrace, but maybe even rediscover part of our essential humanness, by which I mean our essential animalness. In other words, fundamental biology. It sheds light on the prosthesis hypothesis, in other words. Now, social dominance. Let me say, one, a one-liner from Conrad Lorenz would be a good way to start here. He says, all social animals are status seekers. Now, that may be true, uh, but only in a very particular way, because in our society, status seeker, of course, means something very different than it does in nature. Uh, to us, status seeker means the what? upwardly mobile yuppie, or maybe upwardly mobile academic, or maybe the matronly social dragon at the symphony fundraiser, those kind of things, aiming for the top. It means achievement organizations, what it means. 
and it means achievement in a competitive context. It cannot be divorced from a competitive context. No, that's not, I don't think it is, what I mean in non-prosthetic whole societies, meaning wild ones, not domesticated ones. In whole societies, status-seeking means literally that. It means the search for a social place, and it carries no pejorative. Because the search in those societies is for any place, and any place will do. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But status seeking in the human context, especially our Western one, <coughs> makes, <it> th <coughs> excuse me. makes me think of Alfred Adler and the inferiority complex. Well, as you know, Adler split from Freud because he believed the root concern to be not sex, but power. Now, in animal behavior, it comes pretty clear that sex may be one of the trappings or one of the appurtenances of social place, but it's not really that important as a drive. I think we're all agreed on that now. It just isn't. Also, it's beginning to show, I think, that social achievement, in inverted commas, turns out to be not power, but position. And I prefer to say place. It's all me. It's not a loaded word, position. Not position in a power context, in other words. Forget about the power context. <coughs> position in the sense place. Now, some people see place as territory. Uh, I'll deal with that next week. Just set that one on the shelf for now. Now, Adler expressed his views in various ways, various one-liners from him. Uh, an important one. Everyone's goal is one of superiority, he said. And he spoke about the struggle to rise from an inferior position to a superior position. Or from below to above, the very big on, from below to above, and very big on the will to power. Now this had profound effects, as you well know, in both the academic world and the popular world. And today I think it sounds pretty familiar to, to all of us, pretty well entered the, uh, entered the structure. But remember, all this is entirely true of us. I think it is. But it's not true of nature, unfortunately. Unfortunately for the academics who subscribe to this. So, because I suggested the nature of the striving, and I think the striving is indeed real. There is striving. But it isn't for power, it's for place. And the goal is place. The goal is any place will do in the social organization. And I'll try to show that the so-called inferiority complex might better be expressed as the placelessness complex. Very important. Agonizing to be placeless. Now, it is assumption that the goal is superiority. Adler went on to say the following. In the case of those who lose their courage and self-confidence, it is the drive is diverted from the useful to the useless side of life, unquote. Well, Adler had his own interpretations of useful and useless. I won't worry about that. But I think it wouldn't be stretching it too much, wouldn't be stretching its meaning too much to suggest that if everybody's goal is place, not superiority, then in the case of those who lose their sense of place, the drive is diverted to status symbols, what I would call place symbols. And I'm interpreting Adler in that way. Place surrogates, if you like. Guess what? Place prostheses. I can see the array of contemporary commodities, whether it's BMWs, whether they're used as status symbols, as surrogates for the sense of belonging. And it's just as evident in the most expensive condominia as it is in the least expensive, you know, junk towns. The need for these kind of surrogates, illustrating the frustration of the fundamental biological drive for social place. So for these purposes, forget about status symbols and think about place symbols. More significant, I think, and more informative. Actually, I think that Adler was at the point, or may have been at the point of a very important breakthrough, uh, I think that he might have been, but of course he died too early, died way back in 37, but 
when studies of natural social organization had barely, well, it scarcely started in the 30s, and doing, observing certainly in the field, field work, it hadn't begun at all. But he was quite right, I mean, so far as our culture is concerned, I, I believe. And I have this hunch because uh, Adler believed, well, he held the view that the social interest, these are his terms, can entirely supersede the fascist statement, self-interest in human affairs. Very important. Think back to the self thing that we've talked about before. This is now called by some environmental fascism. Social interest can entirely supersede self-interest. No, he says in human affairs, and I can transpose that to all social affairs. Individual cases can certainly be made for it, but it's a tough one, and it's not a popular one. On the other, other hand, though, let's be as objective as we can. That seems to be what we see every time we look at the organization of non-human societies. The interest of the society would appear to come first. He seems to have intuited something, does old Adler. Uh, I think maybe he just intuited out of his own biology he was a living being after all. If he, if he wasn't talking about human nature, he was sure as hell talking about non-human nature. But he didn't know it, because he didn't study non-human nature. Certainly the effect of the uh, subjugation of the individual interest seems to be the integrity of the social group. In other words, what's going on may not be a drive for par after all. Now we're going to have to review some of the theory of hierarchy and social dominance, and let's do that. You've all heard the the Sunday supplements, love, glib, self-explanatory expressions like peck order. The peck order is a loaded one. Uh, it's about chickens, obviously. In a small group of chickens, with lots of room to feed in, scatter the feed around the place. A peck order is not visible. You can not see it nor can you see it in wild chickens. There are five species of wild chickens. So you can't see it there. But if you rig the experiment, and this is what it is, all of this is rigged, and you can quote me, and you rig it by putting all the food in one heap or in one dish for them. This is, it's as simple as that. And then one individual will tend to get at the food first, and then another, and so forth. And the, the one who feeds first is generally called alpha numero uno because the others will allow her to come first and she may well threaten another one if it comes too close while she's at it. The other will back off always. Some say in fear. I deny that. I say she backs off in deference or in compliance. It, she never returns that gesture. She's not afraid. It's in the greater interest. I'll explain. If you take out that alpha out of the flock in your backyard, she's instantly replaced by another one. Absolutely, immediately, and instantly replaced by another one. As though by common consent, this new one is allowed to uh, to assume that role. And if you remove these one after the next, you remove them all one after another of these temporary alphas, you'll find that all of them were hungry, everyone was hungry, because one after another they will approach the food. So the, the, the message, the important message is that alpha-ness was not a unique characteristic of the first bird or the second bird or any other bird down the list that assumed that particular role. Or any, any of them it wasn't a characteristic of them. So the answer then would seem to be perhaps the presence of an alpha, any alpha, any alpha is a group need, not an individual one, because they sure as hell didn't strive for it. But the group needed it, and so the group, as it were, conferred that role upon each one in succession. This is generally called, for reasons that I cannot understand, dominance hierarchy. I've never known why or how this could be seen as dominance hierarchy. And it's understood and interpreted in the, in the conventional wisdom as precedence in competition the alpha role is assumed by one individual, and it's acquiesced to by all the other individuals. And this is called, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, behavioral dominance in all of the most respectable texts. Now, in groups that don't change, 
meaning where individuals aren't added or subtracted, that the whole lot stays the same. Uh, the order of precedence, so-called, is usually pretty clear-cut. We see the uh, sort of linear hierarchy, if we want to see it that way. But we do see that A precedes everybody else, and B precedes everybody else except A, and C, everybody except A, and B, and so forth, down until you get to Omega, who precedes no one, and who is subordinate to all. Now, you all know that stuff. Everybody knows that. But there's more to it than that. Because this pattern of behavior emerges only, but always, in situations that are stressful. You never see it if there isn't a context of stress. Whether that be food shortage for my rigging my experiment by throwing all the, the grain in one dish, food shortage, water shortage, put all the water in one dish, shortage of mates in some cases, shortage of shelter, whatever it might be, anything. Disturbance from outside, foxes charging around, any kind of sudden habitat change. Also, uh, this happens in sport hunting where we remove key individuals, trophy animals and so on. Lots of those things. Lots and lots and lots of stressful situations arising quite naturally in the course of the season. Lots of them. But until very recently, indeed, still, yeah, still, we like to interpret these situations not as being stressful, but as competitive. And it is most interesting indeed how we make that intellectual leap. And of course, it's not an intellectual leap, it's a leap of faith. We ignore the stress. And the most uh, eminent scientists among us fixate on a predisposition to see stress behavior as competitive. Nothing that I've said so far uh, it needs any other evidence than what's in the text already, incidentally. Nothing that I will say this morning. The important thing is that under stress, social precedence of a sort, I find the appropriate word, does emerge. It sure as hell does. And when it does, for perfectly natural reasons having to do with survival, continuity, whatever, the precedence is almost never fought over. You can never see it as the result of a of a uh, competition, a physical competition. They don't fight. It's regularly characteristic. It's mutually, universally agreed upon. It's recognized by every member of the group. Now this is awfully important because those who would now instantly extrapolate to human affairs and then back to nature, of course, forget about the mutuality, the inherent, basic, and fundamental mutuality of non-human social organization, mutually agreed upon, inevitably recognized by all parties, all participants. Now, if you put together a bunch of strangers, uh, chickens I'm talking about still, who don't know each other, you'll see a lot of initial confusion. There'll be a lot of milling around in general, uh, in general uh, unsettled behavior, a lot of pecking, some pecking, and threats, and all that kind of stuff until things get sorted out. And so we immediately leaped upon the notion of peck order in order to explain this, which, of course, is a terrible expression because it casts the whole thing in terms of aggression, quite gratuitously. It is impossible to see aggression in this context, indeed. Realizing this, people began to, they wouldn't back off the hobby horse, but instead of calling it peck order, then nice people started to call it rank order, which is just bad. Obviously. Now, of course, those that are trying to be really respectable call it social dominance, which, of course, changes zilch. The perception is still identical. The perception remains of social hierarchical dominance. The precise language has changed. The perception of competitive strife and hierarchical dominance has not changed one whit, no matter what words you use. So, it turns out that you can make animals competitive or aggressive indeed quite easily by stressing them. And this, of course, is, as I'm sure you will have realized, is, is how cops are forced to fight. You stress them by putting them so close they can't uh, give each other social distance and so there's no option but to fight. Dog fights the same in pit in dog. But in the pit, what's happening is that you're reducing two personal distances to a point at which there's nothing left to do except fight. 
you crowd me enough in the elevator, I'll punch you sooner or later. I mean, this is all that it boils down to. It's a matter of personal distance. And in those cocks, personal distance is quite substantial. That's all that it turns out to be. In horses, there isn't any personal distance much. Depends upon the species involved. In dogs, there is a very considerable one among male dogs. <clears throat> now, what is said in the uh, respective literature is that the cocks fight because there's insufficient room for what they call escape distance. This is the respectable word for personal space. Escape distance, underscoring again, emphasizing implicitly again, the perception of aggression and retreat. We don't have to call it escape distance. Because in, indeed they don't try to escape, they fight. The whole thing is bizarre and upside down. It's personal distance that is being uh, That, that is being, uh, what's the word, I've lost the word, in something, pinched, you know. I, I, I see it as insufficient room for two personal distances, that's all, two extended selves. May I call personal distance extended self when I'm in the elevator and it crowds too much? It's various culturally, as we all know, that we wasps tend to want more space than Italians do. Why, that's purely cultural. Anyway, but in nature, fighting is very rare. You take my word for it. Very, very rare. Long-standing natural groups in which everybody knows everybody else have very, very fight, little fighting, um, zero. What fighting there is, when it seems that there must be some fighting, guess what they do? They ritualize it. Bull, wildebeest, approach one another, touch horns, lock horns, and believe me, ladies and gents, they then stand there with their horns locked, going through a protracted... Uh, ritualized fight. They don't do anything. They both have, they both look at the ground and they just head to head like that and that's their ritualized fight. That's what they do. Congoni, which is a species of hartebeest, goes one step further, locks horns like the uh, wildebeest or the gnu, and then they kneel upon the ground. Extra insurance that nobody can possibly get hurt. And so there they are kneeling with their heads together and that suffices for bloodthirsty competition. Anyway, what we're seeing... Films of elk charging yeah, each yeah. other. Nobody ever gets here, except by, except by accident. What we're seeing in natural groups uh, is not dominance in the anthropomorphic sense, but rather it's a it's a social arrangement. It's an organizing principle which minim minimizes conflict, if anything. It's an arrangement that has most important. Doesn't matter about the individual. It's an arrangement that has survival value for that group. <coughs> And by extension, the community to which they belong. There are all kinds of these kind of arrangements that vary from species to species, even uh, within species, according to different environments, different times of the year. In some, there'll be two parallel organizations, one for males, one for females. That happens. The point is specificity. And the specific nature of the arrangement, however the social organization is dealt with, it seems to be dictated more by the ecology of the species than it does by its genealogy, by its family tree. How it earns a living seems to be more important to its social arrangement, social organization, how it, than its uh, family tree relationships, which is exceedingly interesting to me. So ecology does have a role in helping us to explain some of these things. Then species vary, too, with the, with the intensity with which this is displayed, how visible it is. Wapiti, I guess you're talking about make a big show of it because they're large and spectacular and so on. The mildest show of, uh, of so-called social position turns up to, in our nearest relatives, the great apes, chimps and gorillas. Although Jane Goodall did manage to stir up the chimps to everybody's cost over a period of time, guess how she stirred them up? Do you remember how she did that? Making them competitive and fighting by using the good old chicken yard stress factor, she dumped banana, stacks of bananas in one place. And they fought over them, just as chickens will fight over the food in one place. And she, the the uh, blindness of that. She did realize that, but only about 15 years later. An interesting point that we're, it's true, she published her realization just last year, the year before. An interesting point is, that, that's often overlooked, is that social organization in these patterns that I'm talking about tends to promote a closed society, which is okay too if you're interested in the evolutionary well-being of the group. 
in natural groups who know one another, everybody knows their place, his place, in relation to everybody else. Everybody knows this. And if a stranger appears, the stranger often is clearly under severe psychological stress. And any stranger approaching the band, let's call it a band for the sake of is under a very severe social disadvantage because nobody knows her or nobody knows him and he or she doesn't know anybody else and they haven't shaken the thing out yet so psychologically they're on the defensive and often they will manifest that physically I once watched this is wolves do this uh, you know you hear about lone wolf lone wolf's a contradiction in terms because they're social animals but the odd loner's around and will try to enter back and often gets severely beaten up if it doesn't take time enough to let everybody get to know him or her. I observing a, a, a horde of baboons one time, and there was this beautiful male that was new to this group. He wanted to join it. He'd appeared from somewhere. Gorgeous, big, beautiful, you know, in the prime of shape. But he couldn't break the social, uh, the social uh, bubble or whatever one wants to call it. And guess what he did? And I swear to God, this is true. Guess what he did? He infiltrated himself by going around kissing babies. <laughs> that is what he did. And he was a baboon big enough to beat up a leopard. He was a superb animal. And that's what he did. He babysat a day after day after day and hugged and kissed babies. And they eventually accepted him. So much for the crap. You know, it's just... Uh, but a newcomer, if he doesn't take his time and go around kissing babies and really smoothen it out, uh, he will be at a disadvantage no matter what age or sex the newcomer is, because they don't have a place. And without a place, you're in bad shape. We've probably all seen it. Certainly chicken farmers know about this, and they won't usually put a stranger into a, an established flock for fear of losing it, for fear of the beat up kettle. Rejection of a stranger. Xenophobia, chaps, very important. Very, very important. And not so incidentally, a species with the most complex social organization, with the most sophisticated social organization, always show the highest level of xenophobia. In other words, it's highest, most obvious in ourselves, in uh, lions, in wolves, in those that have a uh, particularly cooperative social organization, or who gather food cooperatively, hunt cooperatively. They usually show the highest level of xenophobia. So can we conclude that xenophobia seems to have evolutionary value, survival value, adaptive value, in highly social species? I believe so. All the evidence points that way. A corollary being that groups of socially cooperative, highly sophisticated, organized species are usually quite small. Incidentally, you might think quite properly, I guess, that a high level of xenophobia would tend to retard evolution, the logically, or hold it back by retarding the mixture of new genetic material into that lot, into that uh, group. But it's offset in those species because in those species also exogamy is more highly developed than in any others. So the two offset, exogamy being the young adults, being uh, leaving on their own or getting thrown out and going establishing new, new families and new groups. So the xenophobia is offset by exogamy. From a genetic point of view, fine. Everybody benefits. Nobody loses. It's okay. There always seems to be some offsetting factor where you have something that's more visibly developed. Now one thing we do see consistently in these kinds of societies is their continuity. Exceedingly important. Relative positions don't turn over very much. They stay pretty much the same. Uh, and this is maintained at least uh, in part. In other words, there's no moving up and moving around and all that. Up and down no longer mean anything. Relative positions don't change very quickly, relative places in the group. And that's maintained, at least partly, by all participants tending to reinforce the existing arrangement by their behavior. Their behavior constantly reinforces whatever structure is in place. And to this, the rank and file contribute much, much, much more to this group than the so-called uh, alphas do. That's accepted in primatology now, but it's only since the 70s 
only since the 70s that the show of dominance so-called even the dominant believers say that dominance is shown more by the behavior of subordinates than it is by the so-called dominant individual or alpha individual sometimes you can recognize this I'll use the word alpha and then I'll get rid of it and we'll never hear it again this sort of top dog by its demeanor the way it carries itself sometimes you can in elephants the old lady who runs the show is usually often a great big one it seems to be anyway but often you can't recognize which is the uh, main one it's always a great deal easier much much easier to spot the central personage by observing the behavior of the others the others is what's important the way the rank and file comport themselves and the way they behave will lead your eye to one individual who may not be doing anything at all but the others are all behaving in relation to that individual guess what you found the uh, nuclear individual who may not be doing anything it's like <laughs> there are lots of human analogies uh, trying to spot the human alpha boss man boss woman in a crowd you don't usually spot the emperor by I, I think of Haley Selassie was about four foot tall you don't usually spot the tiny perfect emperor by his own carriage or his own demeanor what you do notice every time is all the swirling and bowing and scraping and general obsequious behavior around the tiny little emperor he can be found somewhere in the middle if you look sharp enough I've been at a couple of these mass cheek by jaw receptions at Buckingham Palace and the Queen is so tiny you can never see her but you can sure know where she is by all the large men bowing and scraping around her and this is this is terribly important it's the same phenomenon exactly it's a point that's virtually ignored in all of the literature it's never begun to penetrate the popular consciousness especially the popular press carried away as we are by Adler's striving for power after all power needs a goal does it not can there be power without a goal I think not there's not a scrap of evidence anywhere to illustrate the existence of goals in non-human social organization. None. Apart from the goal, if you want to call it a goal, of continuity. And this is basic and fundamental. Whether you want to see that as a goal, I don't know. Purpose, function, whatever. Continuity is fairly it. You see, you can flip this whole dominance thing right over on its head and suggest that it's not a show of power that demonstrates social place but rather a show of compliance they're not going to say subservience or subordinateness if there's a noun in there somewhere subordination but compliance that's all it needs to be seen as the which has no or less a pejorative connotation to it I think in our own society clearly we see many many more shows of deference than we do of naked power when did you last see a show of naked power? I don't think I have. Since the war, I've seen a show of naked power. You just don't see it, at least in our society. But l look at the show of deference that you see on, on social and ceremonial occasions. Yeah. Lieutenant Governor's levy and all this stuff. Or in the marketplace, or in the executive suite, of course. Or whatever. So often Alpha, whoever Alpha turns out to be, doesn't have to do anything at all. Uh, like Malvolio's uh, notions, remember, his power is conferred upon him. And it's reinforced constantly by the behavior of the uh, people around, the individuals around. I'm talking about both our species and others. See, heroes and achievements turn out to be in books, not in nature. And all many heroes, or, or thus it follows any tragedies in nature. Uh, more achievements we don't have any accomplishments in nature Alpha may very well like Malvolio have greatness thrust upon him I think this happens he may well drift into a social vacuum this certainly happens an unoccupied place in other words quite passively doesn't even know he's there till he's in it he may well have certain qualities let's say in the case of a gorilla sheer size will do that's all if the biggest one he's going to be it uh, so he doesn't have to do anything at all doesn't he have to move off his behind but he has become that which he has become he may well have achieved that interesting notion of achievement eh? achieved it in inverted commas but he sure as hell didn't strive for it and he sure as hell didn't compete for it because it was unnecessary 
they didn't know in his, that he had to compete anyway. It just wasn't on. It happened. See, the point, the bottom line being, it was necessary for the continuity of that social organization that somebody, anybody, occupy that central place. And he was it. None of it through his own doing. He just happened to be it. Now, what I'm saying is the following. If non-human social arrangements are maintained chiefly by mutual behavior and reciprocal behavior, if you want, reciprocal is a useful word in this context, uh, and by the rank and file, see, rather than the so-called alpha, then the alleged drive for power in ourselves may be seen as having no biological basis, whatever. Pure invention. Pure invention insofar as our saying if there's any gene for achievement or a gene for competition. Does Alejandro have any that? I haven't discussed it with him. There is indeed a gene for response to stress behavior, however, as we saw in the cockpit and the dog pit. There sure is a gene for response if you're pushed too far. That's a different thing altogether. If this is so, if there is no gene for competition, then there's hope for us after all, I suppose, and our very animalness, which is my point, may be the escape route from the real despotism of our cultural processes, the tyranny of our cultural processes. So the power trip, dear Brutus, is not in our genes, in our nature. It's just in our nurture, and surely we can do something about that. So back for a moment to the non-human organization. Since a, a stable arrangement of place, places for everybody seems to reduce fighting and elbowing and jostling for position, presumably it helps to make group life more efficient. Presumably not. It must have survival value. This is the common platitude in the behavioral tech must have. must have adaptive value in the evolutionary sense and the evolutionary biologist would say at least for those species where it is where it exists at that whatever level it exists because as I said this is variable remember that it's assumed to evolve in the first place this whole art matter of social organization as an adaptation to go with all the other physical and behavioral adaptations of the species concerned. All the other aspects of its biology, of its ecology, and its life history. Remember, there's behavioral adaptation just as there is physiological and anatomical and behavioral dimension of evolutionary biology. Now, you can show this positive value again by having experiments. Now, if you keep mixing up these two, we go back to the chickens in the backyard, Keep mixing them up. Keep adding new. Keep taking out uh, other ones. The social never give the social arrangement a chance to uh, settle down. With a long-standing group where the same individuals have been in the same arrangement for a period of time, they eat better, they gain weight better, they lay better, they do everything better because they're not wasting their energies trying to build a new organization all the time. Whereas the ones we keep mixing up don't lay, they don't eat, they don't do anything, and they're a mess because they're constantly trying to shuffle and reshuffle and organize. Granted, it's a captive situation, I give you that, but it's so, it seems so abundantly cut and dried, so clear, so patently obvious, I think we can pretty safely extrapolate to wild groups as well, which occasionally are stressed for whatever reason. But human societies, which is the important part, I'm now no longer interested in animals for this second, especially those with hyper-developed achievement orientations and competition orientations and political orientations are always in a greater or lesser degree of flux and thus of stress. Constantly, it's unavoidable. Nothing surprises me very much anymore, actually. Now, of course, there are other implications to this in which you're, I fear, that you're average, all-purpose, liberal humanist is going to be at least slightly revolted, but I have to add it for the sake of completeness. If food is short, for whatever reason, certain individuals are going to get it, are going to continue to get what there is, and the others are going to get what's left, if anything. 
In captive flocks, again experimentally, you can have one bird actually gain weight while the others are starving. Same thing in the wild. When the uh, when the migrant mi migra migratory ungulates are not available for a pride of lions, uh, you know they migrate through them. It's, there's this every year season when there's pretty short supply. Guess who eats first? The males do. Do no work at all, and they eat first, and the cubs will starve. The hunting females will eat second because they're needed to supply food. The cubs will will starve in a bad year. It's okay. It's okay. It's the way it is. Under any kind of stress, but at least there's continuity in the group. Hey? The breeding a lot is still there. Under any kind of stress, we know it's the rank and file that are going to show the effects of the stress first. They're going to show lower disease resistance, if nothing else. Which is what you can do experimentally. Now, if, as I've suggested, it's compliant behavior rather than a show of power that determines place and maintains it. And if stress affects different individuals differently, according to their place, the stress will affect them differently, will it not, if it's a matter of food availability then these variable effects are going to re reinforce the organization, aren't they? So an organization may lead not only to the survival of certain individuals uh, in times of stress, but it may also help group survival. And it patently, obviously does. In the very hardest of times, at least a uh, breeding nucleus will make it. And that's what it all boils down to, the simplest. Presumably, that is more, that is preferable to a more democratic arrangement in which everybody starves. I think it is. In that case, evolution uh, would come to a dead end where everybody starves in a hyper democratic situation. And that's not what we believe evolution to be all about stopping dead ends. So, the social place tends to confer peace and coherence, and most important of all, continuity to the group, the social group. It prevents the frictions that could arise otherwise and would lead to energy wasteful competition. framework within which the group functions. Indeed, the framework that holds the whole ball of wax together. Mutuality and reciprocity now being the arrangement to which everybody adheres and within which everyone lives. But since there's no show of power, only ritual, and since the act of reinforcement comes from compliance, not from despotism, not from power, and since there's constant awareness of individual place in relation to others, perhaps, and I, I may, I've mentioned this, I think, earlier already, perhaps what binds the whole, can I dare I call it a solar system, or together is a kind of tension, a kind of electromagnetism, I like to say it, uh, an inter-individual, intra-group, dynamic of some kind of mutuality and reciprocity that holds the whole ball of wax from flying apart. A kind of electromagnetic thing. I see that tension, that magnetism that holds it together, as being generated out of constant, never ceasing, inter individual actions and reactions. As I say, a kind of I have no other word, electromagnetic force force being a cop out, but that's like an expandatory principle. The kind of force that keeps the individual solar system or other system or cell, whatever, from flying apart. And I'll explain, I may have mentioned, I know that we talked about this a little bit. I was, uh, this all came, dawned on me, flashed in front of my eye when I was watching a bunch of uh, langers one time and so on, long tail forest monkey. Now, this uh, I think I'm, I told you before, but I'll tell you the story again because it fits right in here. This tribe had a bunch of adult males, a few, four or five, who interacted all the time. They were noisily, vigorously signaling one another. They might have been far apart. You know, the group was the over place, an area, 
maybe the size of our whole building and area, but they're all in touch and they see one another. So they were, you could pick out the three or so that were adult males in the, uh, you know, in the perfection of their life. Maybe 20 or 30 adults all told, sub-adult males and old males and, and females around and, and children. But no matter what they were doing at any given time, they hardly ever took their eyes off those males for more than a few seconds. Just checking all the time, back and forth, check, 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 keep looking at them. When the males would chatter at one another or make faces or, you know, signs, or even chase, which they do sometimes just for the fun of it, apparently, everything would stop and everybody there would be watching fixedly for some signal that they were supposed to run away or do something. I think it was these interactions between the males that was constantly generating a species of electromagnetism that held that group together. I'm absolutely persuaded of it because that's what they were watching with whatever was passing between those three or four central males. In other words, in this species, the males aren't at the top of a hierarchical pyramid of some kind or ladder in spite of the primatologists, who after all are just uh, former former, uh, in many cases, cultural anthropologists and thus humanists. Very many of them. In spite of that, they're not at the top of a ladder or a, a Eiffel Tower or a pyramid or something. They're the center, the nodal point, the nucleus, what Halling in his ecological work calls the domain of attraction. I'm very attracted to that phrase. I might venture to call a group identity. It's what I was talking about on the board, about a group identity. Okay, and these were not these individuals, but what they were doing, creating the nodal point to hold the ball of wax, this ball of string together. Remember that these males themselves are not the nucleus. They have nothing in the way of rank. They mean nothing. All that matters is what they do as between each other. They themselves, nothing personal in other words, they don't get any, you know, they have no little signs on them saying, I'm alpha. They themselves aren't aren't important. It's the magnetism their existence creates and the interactions between them. They are replaceable. The magnetism is not. All right? Nothing personal. That magnetic tension we must have, and it's their job to provide the nucleus for it. And it's everybody else's job to behave in relation to that nucleus and be fastened to it like the, you know, the ball on the bat and it's an elastic that kids play. It's like that. Now, it's important, it doesn't escape orbit, in other words, to remember that this, this positive tension that derives from inter-individual relationships and reciprocity holds together only so long as the group doesn't get too large. When it gets too large, forget it. There are limits to the number of individuals that can be held together in this domain of attraction or this species of social organization. Can't tolerate crowding, can't tolerate overpopulation. Above a certain level, the tension is broken. Everybody uh, breaks orbit, and all hell breaks loose. Mayhem breaks loose. Now, the critical number, whatever it is, critical density varies from species to species. So let's not hear about man and nature as though they were two individuals. It varies from species to species, and it will also vary within a species depending on where they are, what their habitat is, what the season is, what the situation may be in relation, you know, environmental conditions will change. Now, if you can join me in seeing this binding tension, not necessarily see, as a result of upward striving or competition, but rather is deriving out of a dynamic of mutually understood and mutually acted upon interpersonal relationships and held together by this and I'm just using words because I don't know what it is this magnetic nucleus of individuals not dominant individuals but central or interacting individuals and the individual who the individuals are doesn't even matter then what we're seeing we're seeing what used to be called in all the respectable texts and still is social despotism in an entirely different light in a qualitatively different light from what it is in the behavioral text. It turns out to be not tyranny, but rather mutual aid, social coalescence, 
mutual cooperation toward the greater enterprise, and the greater enterprise is continuity, period. Not achievement, continuity, period. Now, in humankind, concentrations, back to my initial hypothesis, you see, concentrations and densities are much, 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 much too much in our society to allow for this kind of positive small group tension that I'm describing. We've lost it. We've swung out of orbit. So instead of autonomous uh, nuclear, place what? Place related, place identifying, place dependent groups of extended selves. A very long time ago, we substituted, guess what? Institutional surrogates for place. In other words, I don't believe that we're biologically frustrated as both Abna and Lawrence seem to have suggested frustrated in some drive for power. He said they both say that, that we are. I don't believe that. But I believe that we are biologically frustrated in the sense of belonging, in the sense of place. And since we can no longer uh, maintain a mutual group envelope, the way some societies indeed still do, small ones. A group extended self, see, centering on a nuclear member on the board, there was a nucleus, which is an extended other group self, centered on it. We create instead, out of whole cloth, a dominance hierarchy. But unfortunately for us, it's very, very real indeed. And it's held together by upward striving and competition and status symboling to hold the thing together in our society. But then, most regrettably, we do an instant turnabout and project that model upon nature. And then we use that metaphor within which to study and interpret and report upon nature. And that's what's happened to conventional ethology. Once the metaphor becomes the reality, and then we become, this is the good old humanistic stuff again, then we become the unique species that's capable of transcending that nasty British despotism that we have found in nature. It's so simple. Can we use that to reinforce? Of course. Self-delusion is our most fundamental and we're better at self-deception than at anything else. And R.D. Lang says that also. Now I can't emphasize too strongly. Of course we do. It just keeps self-reinforcing. That the need to belong, please hear that the need to belong is not the same as the need to be boss, to be alpha. Please hear that only people need to be alpha. And that need does not appear to be in our genes. I'm saying it over and over and over again, and I will say it again a week today in another context, because it seems to be virtually impossible to wipe out, to expunge this traditional image of social despotism as being natural. It's natural only in stress situations. The point is that the individual status or role or rank simply doesn't matter a hoot. Just so long as everybody knows for sure that you belong. And if you know for sure that you belong, everything else takes care of itself. Once you're sure you belong, then you get for yourself an extended being, the theory goes. And the group is no longer identified with you. It is you. I'm elaborating now upon what was done a week ago. The group is you. And the group has continuity. And the group has continuity. Ergo, you have continuity. If the group is you, you are continuous. So this drive for place, not for power, the drive for individual identity in context of a group, any group will do and any you will do, with the only goal being group continuity, has been called by some primatologists the hereditary compulsion to comply, a most useful phrase to remember. 
the hereditary compulsion to comply. It is this compulsion to comply that I believe is thwarted in us. So if the greater social purpose is indeed compliance, then we should not, should we in suburbia be raising gimlet-eyed little achievers in grade three, should we? We might better apply ourselves to raising little social beings. Let's kick the achievement out of the educational system to start with and put back little social beings. They're certainly more fun to be with, aren't they? Now, there's a final twist to all that. There's a final twist to all that. It's, of course, the perceived dominant role or alpha role of our species in ecosphere. If nature is built on social despotism, as we believe it to be, or as we like to believe it to be, then it's entirely natural for one species to dominate another, is it not, Dr. Darwin? Or for one species to dominate all other species. Perfectly natural in the scheme of things. What rubbish. The certain existence of hierarchy, see, the undeniable existence of hierarchy in the human organization allows us, as I say, to project a hierarchical model upon nature yeah, and then to position who else at the summit of the power pyramid. It's uh, easy. So hierarchy, ergo, is natural, which is what the mark is saying. Now, I've written and gone on about this much, much, much too much to get into it here. It's just the mechanism of projection that I entreat you to remember here. In other words, remember that the set, the set of hidden hypotheses, given, zero order givens and assumptions, within which we do our ethology, within which we do our behavioral studies, within which we do our ecology, and all the rest of our science. We do it within an institutionalized set of zero order assumptions, one miserable little one of which I've tried to illustrate today. If, however, we substitute for the power pyramid the notion of the group extended self, the extended being with its dynamic interacting nucleus, we could still, you know, if we wanted to, it would do no harm. This other fantasizing really doesn't do much harm. We could still see ourselves the center of the universe if we wanted to, but it wouldn't do any harm because we'd also be able to see ourselves as belonging in that universe, and that's all that matters. And to see ourselves as belonging in it, in that universe, would be qualitatively different to anything else in the history of Western culture. That's all. That would be qualitatively different. I think that to try to live without place, place, remember, only is definable in relation to others. I can't have a place in a vacuum. I can only have a place in relation to you. To live without place adds up to incipient paranoia. What else could it do if you don't have place? If you don't have a self-identity? If you don't have a place? If we all know the paranoia and the loner can be dangerous, and we know that, and not only to himself either. How about a species in the same position that might become quite dangerous to itself and to others? Think on that. Since place is only identifiable in relation to others, I think to be without place is dangerous. And as I say, it's more than an individual matter. The group without a place is a dangerous business to encounter also, and a species. Dangerous business. A group without a place, a species without a place, meaning without a social context with which to relate itself. Go back to the bullseye on the board from the expanding center. It's just as unnatural a notion for a species as the place as individual is unnatural. In social beings, take that as given, there are other species, but for social beings to have not have a place is unnatural, something wrong, something potentially dangerous. So I'm suggesting that through its assembled aspirations and achievements, wonderful words, the politicos is still used aspirations and achievements, don't they? The industrial growth society may well be in 
the process, or may have done so by this time. The dreadful may already have happened, for all I know, Dr. Heidegger. But the Industrial Growth Society may well be in the process of divesting itself of place in the ecosphere. I think this was probably a reasonable conclusion to come to. And if that is, in fact, what's happening, then that would leave us a hell of a lot to have some nightmares about. Anyhow, I think I'll stop there. Uh, points for possible discussion later. I will talk next time that I, that I talk about uh, extending this and the notion of territories and uh, competition. So that's just one more building block in the prosthesis hypothesis. What? No. Bricks and, and arrows? Slings and arrows and bricks and bats? You buy all that, do you? Well, this, uh, I'd like to, not, not a sling, but just a question, a point of information on it, for further clarification. Um, as you describe sense of place, it seems to be mostly to be sense of place that is between, um, up within the group. Um, I don't know how you see sense of place in terms of ecology relations. Well, let's see, this comes to this more mystical uh, uh, extension of that. If I'm the group, if the group is me, if I have no getting back to the individual self thing, individual self becomes relatively unimportant in this context. It's a group identity. It's our group that this is me. You're me, everybody's me. This then, as I was trying to say last time, may very well have a, a common consciousness that extends itself into the community, the multi-species community. And maybe my group of uh, hunter-gatherers or predators or whatever I you want to label my group or this group here, maybe this has no meaning without being able to be, uh, to be defined in terms of the greater community in which it lives. And this is so on ad infinitum up the line. This is what uh, comes to mind. This is what I say. But you're not going to do that in some in some linear, abstract uh, way. It won't work that way. But I think that by extension, the experience of the individual, I can see as being the experience of the group. And the moment it's the experience of the group, it's a community experience. It's a multi and interspecies one. And to go back to, we were talking about Barry Lopez last time, Vicky or somebody like the same thing. Huh. It's sort of, on Tuesday I was trying to get at the, when I use the example of the musk ox and, and yep. a particular species doing certain, having certain behavioral things that defend or, you know, protect its, its continued existence. And now I'm seeing it, you know, they have to protect their species, but that is, of course, the continuity of the group is also important for the continuity of the community. The community. This is right. This is right. Again, I think an interesting uh, a little bit of light on the ecologic wisdom that simplification is dangerous uh, of communities or of ecosystems or whatever. Did you see your hand up, Colin? I was going to ask you if you thought it was possible in our society to develop sites of place. I don't know. I wish you wouldn't pin me down because if you pin me too down, too hard down, Colin, I might tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to do that just yet. I don't want to tell the truth just yet until the term's over. Mm -hmm. I think you can, I think you can, can uh, infer what I'm saying. I don't know. I, don't know. I know a group's great, isn't it? The magnetism. There's a, uh, there's a, when you have a group like this, there's a, uh, an intellectual, cultural, and energetic envelope that contains us. I mean, this is my common experience in classes like this. But the magic goes when we go out the door. Something else like that. But this is neat because this is heretical stuff you're hearing this morning. Uh, you go and look at any of the uh, any of the texts. But again, I entreat you to remember that it's on the same body of evidence as the uh, as the stuff that you can read. Take your own choice. Doesn't matter. Yeah. The, the observations are the same. This is what's fascinating. 
And I don't care about this specific subject, obviously. I'm simply trying to illustrate that we live within, as the prisoners of a cultural envelope of beliefs that are not questioned and that are either for cause zero order. That's all the message. Is. So your business as uh, interdisciplinarians is to attack belief, reveal, shed light, understand, dissect. Your dissecting again. But this is the job. This is the job. Now, before we, that's a day's work already, eh? before we depart, who's going to uh, come, who's going to do this next time? Mark? Marnie, did you hear the whole thing? Were you here for the whole thing? Yeah, okay. Three? Paul, did I see your hand up too? Mark and Paul and Marty. We have time for another question. Oh yeah, it's only quarter past. Yeah. I was going to fudge it. If there was no more questions, I was going to leave and have a coffee. Um, <coughs> I'm trying to get at this concept of the alpha and the, you know, the the need to have an alpha at all. Uh, you you know, don't need him. Don't please, Mike. That's right. An alpha, no, no. An alpha, any alpha. You said any alpha. That's right. Anybody will do yeah. so long as it generates that magnetism. Mm -hmm. I don't care for that. Yeah, this is right. Are you saying do you have any further kind of a elaboration on? Because you see, at the end, you did kind of make an apology that it comes down to a kind of non-explanatory principle that you, you know the words are kind of a problem. Uh, yeah, the words are a like problem for this nuclear thing. Uh, that's all. I, that's all I apologize for. Was not having language for. I, I hate the notion of forces, because I'll come back to that in another talk. We were talking last night. I have a sister who's interested in pre-medieval things. You talk about that they believed in forces, and I said, "What the hell do you think economists believe in today? Market forces? It still is not identified as it was in the 11th century." And Talk about forces, but it's still talking forces, which we were in the United States. Fascinating. Anyway, uh, aren't they undefined forces? American forces, ask any ego. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this it is, uh, yeah, the who they are doesn't matter a hoot, but it's something, some electromagnetism generated here that holds these individuals that are around the periphery together. That's the way I see it. There's one way of each of seeing it. And the odd one that flies out of our Goodbye, Charlie. It's okay. The copy that this is what matters. This is what matters, not that. So it would be. Yeah. Okay. Did I understand correctly that you were saying, for example, in, in chickens, under a condition of no stress, there's no you can't see it. It is invisible. There's no. It doesn't. Do you think it's there? Hmm? Do you think there is an alpha, even if, even under conditions of well, the, stress? There is somebody who's going to be the moment the stress comes because it's essential that it happen. Yeah. yeah. But are you saying that this, the alpha only emerges under conditions of stress? Yes. Okay. Then. In to the, our eyes. Okay. Yeah. But in wolves, for example, where we know the alpha is there, pretty much most of the time. I don't know that. Well, from from. Like in wolves. I know. Can you Well, any predator who's living on the on the knife edge is under stress most of the time. Chickens are not. They absolutely give them what they're doing. Wolves are stressed 24 hours a day, I would say. Or maybe, you know, an hour when they're not. But generally speaking, they are. They need that organization all the time because they've got to eat today. I think this is why, Mark, and uh, lions are the same. Except the stress with them shows because they don't have to eat every day. But you know, I think all predators are stressed all the time, and all predators, as it turns out, most of them are highly social critters. Not all, but uh, Kim. I'm just wondering if there are any um, sort of prominent ecologists who are starting to look at this and starting to analyze the pieces of this in the environment in. There's lots of ecologists talking about damn few ethologists yet. Some. Okay. And the ethologists there are all women. Uh, 
I'm making generalizations to make a point. They're mostly women. Mostly women. They're understanding this. Mostly feminist primatologists, and thank God there's a whole new generation of them. Wonderful women doing primatological work now. But these are young women. These are, these are people in their 30s and 40s. They should not. Oh, a million. Um, Fedigan is an important one who got on a thing called Primate Paradigm. She's Canadian. She's out in Calgary. I forget her first name, Anne Marie or something like that. Fedigan, a very successful book. Uh, oh, this is slew. Thelma Rowell, R-O-W-E-L-L, who's an Australian, I think. I can't remember. Anyways, a whole slew of them came. Uh, much of their work has been reviewed by a gal called Donna Haraway, who's not a primatologist, she's a historian of science, but a uh, philosopher of science, in this for obvious reasons. H A R R A W A Y, Donna, and she's at the University of California, Santa Cruz. There's a whole uh, wonderful uh, uh, cohort of these women now. That's something we've got to thank feminism for, seeing through some of this stuff. And there are men who are beginning to listen, a few. Shirley Strum in Kenya, she comes from, she's another American. She was hard enough to crack. Women are worse than men when they carry the conventional wisdom, you know. Especially um, girls who went to uh, normally uh, male schools and decided to become natural women, you know, they exist. In biology, unfortunately. Shirley Strum's one of those. But you can crack them, too. It seems to be defensive they go into uh, 